I'm Matt. And I'm Nate. And this is Not Quite Religious, a podcast where a Christian pastor and a former evangelical turned atheist have conversations about faith, religion, philosophy, and life while drinking coffee. Welcome to episode four, or possibly three, depending if we um, choose to release the previous one or not, um, where we're going to discuss what I see as a new fundamentalism, um, which I think will make more sense as we go forward. Um, for those of you unaware, like fundamentalism kind of, I think, historically started off in the early 1900s, and then it got another resurgence in the 60s, 70s with sort of Bob Jones University and some of these more... Um, separatist That's fair. movements. Yep. Um, and I, I see that happening today, at least with some of the reformed Christians on my Facebook feed. Um, mm. So, you know, when me and Matt come up with episodes, we kind of talk a little bit um, beforehand about what the episode's going to be, but really everything is kind of off the cuff. Um, so, but before that, if you listen to our previous episode on um, reformed soteriology and sort of how that led to a deconstructing of my faith that led to atheism and Matt sort of had a, wasn't ever quite as reformed as me, I don't think. Right. Um, but reformed theology sort of led you down a different path towards um, what you said when we were discussing this as sort of mysticism, yeah, um, which has a long tradition in the church. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, like the, the at least modern evangelical churches, I experienced it lost a lot of mysticism. Um, lost a lot of sort of meditating on scripture. Yeah. So you, you know, you read your Bible plan, you go through it and then what's more useful or not more useful. Like the Bible is really, really useful. And most of my pastor friends would say, you got to read it every day, but Wayne Grudem's systematic theology yeah. is, you know, also you, that's it, the truth. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it laid out in a way that like, you don't need to read the whole Bible and figure it out for yourself. Someone already did it. And they're going to give you the proof text and the verses. And so you can go and look it up yourself. And then you're like, oh, yeah, like, he's right. right. Um, and, you know, Wayne Grubb isn't the only one who wrote systematic theologies. Lots of people have throughout history um, is an attempt to teach people. Because, the you know, the Bible is confusing sometimes. And I think what we talked about <laughs> last time is it's not just historical facts. It's also poetry and prophecy. Um, and by prophecy, you know, we can take that in both terms. It's someone telling the future and also a veiled way to get a people to repent or figure out that they're wrong without being like, Hey, you're a jackhole. Yeah, it is. It can, it, religion is a convenient mechanism of control for people who, who want to do that kind of thing. I readily admit that. Sure. But I guess what I'm saying with prophecy though, is like, it doesn't always, even in the Bible doesn't mean always telling the future. Yes. It means more, uh, you know, a lot of times calling people back to repentance yeah. Calling people back to faith and saying, like, if you do this, um, it's going to go well because if you live within the parameters, like we were talking about with the Proverbs, if you live in the parameters of God's design for the universe, mm-hmm. um, it goes better for you. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the prophets in the Old Testament, although New Testament writers will say they're pointing to Jesus, they would also say they're also telling Israel, like, stop worshiping Baal because it's not going to go well. Come right. back to Yahweh. Well, they're verbalized intuition. Prophecy is verbalized intuition about what's going on. Yeah, that's and, a great way to say it. And and what <laughs> might what might happen if things continue the way that they are. Um, they called it uh, the Holy Spirit speaking to them, and and I think uh, I can accept that. But another way of saying that is, prophets are very intuitive and very in tune with the the zeitgeist, not only of their time but also of their people and are also very in tune with the scriptures themselves and have a passion for uh, seeing it lived out authentically, uh, seeing the, the the ethics more than the ceremony sure. of, of Torah lived out authentically. And um, so you see that even in modern day prophets. Modern day prophets aren't people who are coming to town and being like, all right, everybody gather around. I'm going to tell you about the future. To be fair, it's like some, a soothsayer. some are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, some are. But that's not, I wouldn't call them prophets. I would just call them uh, lunatics. <laughs> uh, but but a, a modern-day prophet like a, uh, like a Martin Luther King or like a Dietrich Bonhoeffer or somebody like that is like, is like somebody who y'all are focused on mechanics and ceremony and right-practiced religion and 
people are dying and and starving and being oppressed and that's really the heart and ethics of our our, of our faith and if we're not pursuing that then it doesn't really matter all the stuff that you're doing it's the same message over and over it's what the prophet said to israel it's what jesus said to his people and uh those those people end up uh they, they end up on the stake or on the cutting board or on the cross or with yeah, a bullet in their head. People don't really like prophets. No. Right. That, that's true regardless of how you read the Old Testament, whether it's historical or narrative or poetic. Like it, it didn't end well for most prophets. Right. Um, didn't at least <laughs> initially it didn't end well for Jesus. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And, and he's crucified for telling the, the, you know, Pharisees and Sadducees, the Jewish people, like you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. You're not caring for the poor. The Samaritans got it more right than you. Mm -hmm. Um, And not the literal Samaritan, like in the story. And also for telling the Romans, like you're also kind of jerks, like, Mm -hmm. right. Um, And and neither group was really appreciative (laughs) of that. Yeah. Jesus telling the Romans that they're jerks. That's interesting. I, I do remember one specific time where he called out a Roman in front of his own people and and was like here's the example of true faith with which is a which is just a paradigm crasher um and in some ways he was, maybe it was like 12% trolling in a way mm. uh Jesus but, the original troll yeah i mean prophets i think yeah. are are sort of <laughs> trolling which is why their language is is so hyper you know over the top like uh calling their own people prostitutes. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. And horrors, you know, that's the kind of the language and the, the language can get pretty dirty. Like, uh, but what I was going to say about the, like even the old Testament prophets in their relationship to the revelation that came before them, the, the Torah, uh, I mean, in the Torah, it says these sacrifices are an everlasting ordinance and the prophets are like, uh, sacrifices and offerings you did not require, right. you know. So they're already suggesting a, uh, a a different, essentially a different way to like look at scripture, or at least they're suggesting there's something deeper than just a mechanical literalist ob- observance um, to it. And you're and you're missing it, and because you're missing the deeper thing, you're actually not in the will of God. And not only not in the will of God, you don't even know God. Yeah. Um, Which I think leads to your sort of mysticism mm -hmm. where we were talking about, um, that, you know, I became reformed and then lost my faith. Although I still read the Bible in a reformed manner because I'm a very black and white person. Mm. Like I was a physics major, um, which should lead to a little bit of mysticism because, you know, Electrons are both particles and waves at the same time, and mm-hmm. probably just something completely other, but we don't have language to describe what that is. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, fields are now where it's at, like, like particles are a production of higher energy within this field that just sort of exists through space time. And now even like the multiverse probably exists not in the Doctor Strange way mm-hmm. uh, to bring back Marvel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think... So maybe I should be more of a mysticist, but I'm very much like, no, like two plus two always equals four. And I think you're like, well, that's true. Unless like you're using clock mechanics, in which case, like <laughs> right. if you're at 11 p.m. and you add three, you're now at two. And I'm like, no, 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 11 <laughs> plus three is is 14. So just to give you some fair time, since last time we really focused on my reading of scripture and now me saying like, I'm much more black and white. Do you want to talk a little bit before we get into fundamentalism, mm-hmm. which is also black and white? Mm-hmm. Um, of like your mysticism and how that has a, a, a long tradition within Christianity. Um, and so you're not a heretic, <laughs> but you're also not reading the Bible the same way I am. I'll let other people judge if I'm a heretic or not. Um, <laughs> what, what, I'll, what I'll say is that as it relates to you and I and, and how we relate as people, I think you're right on in terms of black and white for you. And and for me, it's definitely not black and right, black and white. I don't know if it's... It's gray, but I like your illustration about science because I think that's a way for you to access like your own your own mysticism. At some point, my experience is if you think and question something deeply enough and you're willing to suspend the truth, then you just always keep going. And that's something that I appreciate 
about science before I, uh, you know, when I was in, when I was fully embedded in the Christian bubble, uh, I had a straw man of what science was. I thought of it the same way that I thought Christians read the Bible. In other words, here's this set of facts, very Newtonian, I think. Yeah. Like, here's the set of facts. Once we got them all, then then we got it. Whereas I think what and science... We're, and we figured it out. And we figured it out. Whereas I think what science is now is like almost... Like, we've learned that we're not... We're, we may never figure it out. But we also have learned that what we know now is is probably... We're probably not exactly right. And so that's that enables us to like keep learning and keep knowing more. So we're always knowing more and whether or not you reach the bottom is like, that's not even the point. It's about, it's about learning. And and so I think there's, so there's some in, intersectionality ironically there in, in my perspective in science. And I, and I love the idea that science could be mystical because that makes total sense to me actually. <laughs> um, as, as opposed to, uh, fundamentalism which the more i learn about science the less i look at it as being a fundamentalist in 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 nature but yeah i i think of myself like why the way i'm wired more more like a mystic so when i open say the bible or any any work that's not I'll put it this way. The only book that I ever open up and think I don't have freedom in interpretation is like the car manual. Yeah. You know? Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) If it says you're, you know, you need to put this bolt to this much torque, you better not put any more on it. I am not motivated to read into anything or to put (laughs) different lenses on and switch up lenses when I don't read the car manual the way I read like Steinbeck. It's like, you know, um... And I don't read the Bible the way I read the car manual. So I try on different lenses with the Bible. It's like, what if we looked at it from the perspective of the Enlightenment? Or what if we looked at it from the perspective of Derrida? <laughs> what if we looked at it from the perspective of uh, Kierkegaard or, like, or, or through the lens of um, oppressed peoples? Um, all that kind of stuff. So when you, when you do that, and you kind of allow that freedom. You look at the Bible and you, and you think it's not a car manual. It's about my relationship to myself, to God, to the people around me, to my society. Um, but for me, even, even the society parts like on the outer realms of what is truly meaningful to me in that um, different, different things come out and, the Bible just ends up relating to itself in a way that is, is, uh, it, for me, my experience has been, uh, that it's, it's leading me to something that cannot be articulated, um, in any sort of report manual, manual kind of way. But when you, when you're, the thing is, like when you communicate what you discovered in Scripture to other people, and their light, eyes light up because they haven't thought of it that way before, or on the other hand, they're like, "How did you read what I read?" And I'm getting the same thing, even though it's not immediately apparent. How you know you read something like the women taking the spices to the tomb, and all of a sudden that made me think of what Paul was saying about the aroma of death in second Corinthians. I just related these two references, but I don't think when Paul wrote that, he was like, Ooh, this is going to be a nice metaphor, (laughs) but something about that, though, that phraseology connected me to that. And then say, I say that to another person and they're like, I was thinking about it that way too. There's, there's something connecting us that's invisible and not, not tangible and something we can't quite put into the words, but it's real. Um, to I I can't I can't go back to reading the Bible as if it's a blank slate and it's telling me it's telling me what the world is about and what the capital T truths are and I just it's not what it is to me. Right. Although <clears throat> I think to be fair you would say there are some capital T truths in there. Sure. Yeah. And and then I and then I would say I, f- I don't feel 
a ton of pressure to defend them, though. Sure. <laughs> only to only to the extent that I can rebuke my own for sa- for going.